Okay, so hello everyone, welcome to the QLS seminar. Um, so today, uh, Sebastian Gold, we have the pleasure to, to have Sebastian here. Let me quickly introduce him. I think everyone knows him, but so Sebastian uh, is a statistical physicist who did uh, his PhD in Germany on stochastic thermodynamics. He then moved for a postdoc in Paris, um, in the group of Florence Zakala and Lenkas de Borova, working on the, uh, the theory of neural networks. And recently, um, we, we, we are glad to, to, to have welcomed him in, in Trieste. So he started a position as an assistant professor in CISA, where he created a group on the theory of neural networks. And so he's an expert on the, on the dynamical properties of learning in these machines. And so we'll have a course on that. Uh, welcome, Sebastian, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Thank you for the nice, uh, for the nice words. And, and thank you for, for inviting me. Um, it's really a pleasure. Like you said, I'm, I'm right next door here in CISA. And I'm, I'm looking forward to coming over more often in the next few weeks and months. But for today, um, let's, let's work with what we have. So, so like Jean said, um, I'm, I'm a statistical physicist, but these days I'm mostly interested in, in neural networks and learning in neural networks, and in particular in, in what happens during learning, so in the, in the dynamics. And so the goal of these, of these two lectures today and next week will be to, to discuss a little bit what happens, to discuss a little bit the particular limit of dynamics of learning um, where we can analyze things and analyze things you know, um, in, a, in a fairly straightforward way, but which still gives us some, some useful insights, which then we will see also carry over to, to other setups. So um, the, the idea is really to make this, or, you know, or I'd like to make this really as interactive as possible. So um, I'll do a lot on the, on the whiteboard, or on the OneNote here, but please uh, ask questions. Please feel free to, to interrupt. I'm not sure if I will always see you if you raise your hand. So just, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask questions as we go along. And I will always, uh, I will also have some slides towards the end of today's lecture, but yeah, really, this is designed to be uh, interrupted. So um, yeah, what's the goal for today? So the goal is to, to um, in the first step today, look at a certain model of, of, of neural networks and to look at its learning, right? And so the model of neural networks that we're going to look at, it's a two layer neural network. And um, I'm just gonna write it down very quickly. So the goal or what we have in mind will be a setup where you, know, you have some, some task, some high dimensional task. So you might want to classify some images. You might want to yeah, know whether the, pic the, the images that you show to you in your networks contain dogs or, or cats or, or none of the above. So um, if you will, the, 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 the task that we always have in mind is one that's called supervised learning. So let me get my pen to work. So we will always be in this supervised learning scenario where you have high dimensional inputs, which we're gonna call X. And these high dimensional inputs, you know, they might be images, they might be word representations in natural language. Um, and we're gonna say they're a high dimensional vector in, in D dimension. And each of these inputs has a label, okay? Um, we're gonna call that, we're gonna call that Y star. And this label is, is a scalar, okay? And this could be, for example, um, plus or minus one if you want to make a difference between cats and dogs, right? So for example, you know, X would be images and Y would be, plus one, and Y star would be, plus or minus one, plus one if it's a dog, minus one if it's a cat, okay? And so you want to learn this function. You want to learn a function that takes you from this high dimensional input X to the, to the scalar variable Y. And one you know, very popular class of functions and a very powerful class of functions are, are neural networks, okay? And these neural networks that you use in, in practice these days, they're usually very deep in the sense that they have many layers of weights. And um, that's still a big challenge for us to, to analyze theoretically really in detail. So what we usually do in theory is we, we look at model of neural networks. So in other words, we look at simple neural networks. In particular, we look at networks with two layers of weight. So sort of graphically, you can think about this neural network as 
and input layer. So this is just your input vector X, okay? And then you feed that through what's called a fully connected network layer, sorry. And I'm gonna write down in a second what that does. That gives you some hidden or latent representations. Those are your neurons, if you will, okay? And then you get a scalar output, which is the prediction of the student, which you're just gonna call Y. So Y star is what you want, the true label, and Y is the prediction of your network model. Now as a function, I said, you know, for example, function class, as a function, you can simply write this um, as phi theta of X. So phi will be the neural network. Theta will always be the parameters, X is, X is the input. And in this case, we can write it with the following expression, and I'll walk you through it in a second. Okay, so you'll see this network has, has two layers in the sense that there's two matrices of weights, W and V. There's something wrong with my pen, I'm sorry about that. And V. And so at the first layer, you know, you have this weight matrix W, which is a K times, M matrix, uh, K times N matrix, there's K neurons. And so you take the matrix product, W times X, you normalize it so that, you know, everything is nice and well behaved in the order one. And then you apply a nonlinear function G. And this nonlinearity, so this is a scalar function. Um, there's different choices that you could have. We are gonna look at two in particular. One is the sigmoidal function, which looks like this. And another one is a very popular function in, in neural networks these days, which is called the ReLU, uh, the rectified linear unit, and which looks like this. So just a linear function um, for positive lambda and zero for negative lambda. And then we have a second layer of weights that I'm gonna call V. And you just take the sum over the neurons weighted by the second layer weights, and that gives you the output, okay? So this is gonna be the, the function class that we're going to, to focus on, the two, these two layer networks. Now we're gonna focus on a particular limit to look at these. And this limit will be um, what I'll call the ODE limit. And this ODE limit looks like this. So you take the input dimension going to infinity while the number of neurons, K, stays of order one, okay? Now there are other limits. There is, for example, a limit where you do the opposite, where you keep the input dimension finite and you send the number of neurons in your network of hidden nodes um, to infinity. That's what we're gonna call the mean field limit. I'm gonna focus on this ODE limit here, but then at the end of today's session, we'll talk a little bit about what I said in this two layer case and the ODE limit relates to other limits too, okay? Now, okay, you have all these weights, W, V. You want to learn some, some sort of function. How do you find these weights, right? If you just put random matrices there, then it's just gonna give random answers. And the solution of course, is that you don't write down the, the weight matrices, but you find them by training. So what does that mean? Training. So we're gonna train these, um, these weights using a gradient descent, okay? So we're gonna do really just plain gradient descent on, um, in this case, the quadratic loss, as you would expect. So I have to like check how I wrote this down so consistent my notation. So um, really broadly, I'm gonna be looking at all my parameters here for the network at step mu plus one. Okay, and mu is just the step of the algorithm. Up. And this is gonna be equal to a learning rate, which I'm gonna call eta times the gradient of some loss function. And this loss function takes in the output of my neural network, okay, my prediction, and, and the true label of an input. Okay, and here throughout this um, throughout this talk, to keep things simple, I'm going to look at the case where L is just the mean squared error, like this. Okay, and so at each step of the algorithm, you evaluate this gradient using a particular input-output pair, 
Okay, this is a, this is a gradient, so you need to evaluate at a particular point, and this point will be just a pair of of inputs and its true label, and this gives you a quantity, and with that you then update your your weights at at each step. Okay. And, and basically the goal of, of the next two lectures is to understand two things, is to understand, well, what happens during the dynamics of learning, okay? So, so how, can we, how can we describe uh, what's going on here? Um, so on. what are the dynamics? And this is gonna be the focus of today. This is online learning, right? This is online learning. I'm going to say this in, in, in a second, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm going to look at online learning. And I'll say in a second what that, what that means. And the second question is, um, what kind of impact does the structure in the data have here, OK? I should write shorter sentences. Have implement has data structure. And that's going to be the focus of the second lecture. Okay, so this is maybe a good moment to um, zoom out and and pause for a second. Now, this might be very basic in terms of the setup for for many of you, and I'm sure many of you have seen this. I just wanted to write these things down because we, a we're going to need the notation ones, and b I wasn't quite sure about the, everybody's background. So if you have a question about the setup, now is I think a good time uh, to ask it. And then okay, I'll, and then Matthias, I'll, I'll come back to your to your question. So are there any questions on the setup? Very nice. Okay, then let's zoom back in. I'm really enjoying this actually. And let's start by looking at the dynamics. And this is of course, you know, um, a key topic in the theory of neural networks. And so there's been, there's a lot of sort of related work and there's a lot of limits in which you could look at this. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna effectively look at this online learning limit. So what does that mean? That means, that at each step of SGD, okay, so at each step of SGD, stochastic gradient descent, I'm gonna use a new example to evaluate the gradient. So I'm, at each step of SGD, I'm gonna look at my, my data set with my images, and I'm gonna take a new image, and I'm gonna show that to the network and let it update its weights, okay? And then I'm never gonna use that image again. And that sounds like a sort of innocuous um, thing, or it's very, it sounds like not very efficient, but from a theoretical point of view, as we will see later, that's really important. That really makes this analysis that we're gonna do um, possible. And indeed extending this analysis to a finite data set where you would resample your data samples, uh, that's still to a large extent an, an open problem. So we're gonna look at this in the online learning limit. And um, so what have people done already here? So people have already looked at, for example, um, linear networks, okay? So this is when your activation function is just a linear activation function. G of X is just X. There's a lot of literature on that going back to the 90s. And I um, already discussed with Jean after this talk, I will share these notes and I will give some references um, to, to, to the works that looked in this in, in more detail, okay? Um, there is then also some work, and this is what we're going to review today, in this limit on the nonlinear networks. And that was done by Sudden Solar and by Biel and Riegler back in the 90s. That's going to be our focus today. And then more recently, people have looked at the dynamics of the mean field limit. Um, so this was the series of papers in 2018, and we'll come back to that at the end of today's lecture. All right. So, Let's jump right in. And if I say, let's jump right into to analyzing the dynamics, what's actually the quantity that I'm interested in? What's the quantity that I want to track? Well, what, what is interesting here? I have, I have order n number of parameters, right? So the statistical physicists of you uh, will remember, okay, so here's my, my order n. There, there's loads of parameters. I, I'm not gonna track every single one of them, right? Um, what's the, the key quantity that describes the performance of my neural network? And that's going to be the test error. 
okay, of the neural network. We're going to call that epsilon g, and we're going to define this as the average over my data distribution of my network output. minus the true label, okay? So our goal will be to understand how does this guy depend on time? How does this guy evolve during training? At the beginning, this will be random guessing, okay? And then during the course of training, this error gen of generalization will go down and we want to know, okay, how, how does it go down? What kind of periods are there? What happens in the neural network when this guy goes down and so on. Now I've written this average over the data here in a sort of very uh, general way. And so far, I haven't really said anything about where my data comes from. But if you remember, you know, I was giving this example of images of cats and dogs. And we, we don't have the tools mathematically yet to analyze real data, to analyze what happens with real images. Uh, we don't really have mathematically crisp uh, techniques to, to describe what's going on there. Um, so there's two ways you can, you can go about this, this dilemma. You can either say, um, so, to deal with data, there's two approaches. You can either say, well, if we can't really say something about real data, then let's just say something that's really general and that's independent of my, of my data, okay? And that's the approach in a lot of statistics and a lot of statistical learning theory, what people will try to do, statistical learning theory, what a lot of people will do is then say, okay, I'm just gonna prove something about this generalization error. I'm gonna show that it's gonna be lower than 0.1, or it's going to be lower than one over the number of samples in my training set, something like this. But I'm not really going to make any assumptions on the data. So my results are going to hold for any kind of data. In particular, that means that they will hold for the worst possible kind of data, right? So, you know, there's something very nice about pictures of dogs and cats that makes it that, you know, we humans, for example, can differentiate, differentiate them without a problem. But you could also think of some really adversarially constructed data sets. And if you don't make any assumptions on your data, well, then you have to take these into account too, right? And a somewhat complementary um, way to deal with data structure is one that in, in statistical physics, we would call the teacher-student approach. And in the teacher-student setup, you're going to say the following. You're going to say, well, Okay, it's hard to make, make statements for really images. So how about we replace the images and their label with something that's a bit more tractable from an analytic point of view, but which has some structure. And then we see how that structure shows up in the dynamics of learning. And in particular, the idea of the teacher-student setup is to train a neural network like the one I just wrote down over there, which we're, which we're gonna call the student now, and train it on data that comes from a teacher. More precisely, we're gonna look at the case where the inputs X are drawn IID from the normal distribution with mean zero and uh, the identity covariance, okay? And the true label of each of these inputs is gonna be given by another neural network that we're gonna call the teacher who has start parameters, okay? And the teacher is just gonna be another two layer neural network like the student, it's gonna have random weights and um, and yeah, and we're just going to see what the student does on this type of data. So this is, of course, a, a sketch, right? This is a huge simplification compared to the images that we talked about just before. But it has some some advantages. It makes the analysis that we're going to do uh, now uh, possible. And now it's the first model of of data structure. Okay, so the inputs here are a bit unstructured. They're just IID Gaussians. And this is the standard approach and you will find in like a thousand papers. And we're gonna to talk tomorrow about how to make this a bit more structured. There is structure here in the labels, right? And the structure comes from the teacher. For example, how many neurons does the teacher have? We're gonna call that M, right? What activation function is the teacher going to use? Is it gonna use a ReLU? Is it gonna use a sigmoid? So there's some structure here in the task that we're trying to learn, and now we can track how the structure is learned, at which point during learning, um, and so on. Okay, so that's the setup. Two layer neural networks and the teacher-student setup. Any questions?
Very good. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, the structure usually is in the X, not yes. in Y, right? Yes, I mean, I would say there's structure usually in both, right? If you, if you take a typical image classification data set, there's structure in the X in the sense that you can do unsupervised learning, you could do some clustering approaches, and that will tell you something about the data. And then there's some additional structure in the task in the sense that you know, only some of this information from the images is relevant for the task, right? The lightning, the angle, the orientation of the image, that doesn't change whether something is a cat or a dog. So there's structure in both usually. In this classical teacher-student setup, there is in a sense no structure in the inputs, which is nice from a theoretical point of view, but I agree with you, it's, it's terrible from a modeling point of view. There's only structure in the task. And what we're gonna to do tomorrow is look at um, some recent work that, that we've done recently, and um, that really tries to put some structure back into the X and you know, have a slightly more realistic model of inputs within the teacher-student setup. Yeah, so, so the, I mean, the general question is that uh, the type of problem that you are uh, addressing uh, is very, I mean, it's learning a uh, structure uh, from uh, noise, essentially, right? Or classify, learning a classification of noise. Yes, it's a, it's a, so exactly, it's a classification or in this case, a regression problem on noise data, yes. Any other questions? Good point. Sorry, sorry, Sebastian. I, yes, I, I think that it, there is learning. Uh, I mean, the teacher network is not learning. Is is probably no, no. Pro very good point. You choose the ran random weights, and then and the network is processed. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't emphasize that. So the teacher is, is exactly like you said, you draw its weight at random from the beginning, usually you take some IID weights from I don't know, the Gaussian, but then you freeze them and, and they're gonna stay constant during, during learning. You could also like in, in our approach or in, in, in this sudden solar approach, you can also make the teacher time dependent or something, um, but, but really for now it's gonna be frozen. Thanks. Um, please, <clears throat> I have a question. Yes, go. Uh, when you when you say at each step you have um, a new sample, what does that mean really? Because I didn't understand well. It's here. Yes. When you um, say at, is when you say at each step you have a new sample. So what I'm thinking about here is okay. So I have this teacher now; it's frozen, and I have my student, and I'm going to train it using gradient descent, right? And using gradient descent. I'm gonna up at each step of gradient descent, I'm gonna evaluate the gradient of my loss function and you know, compute some new weights, okay? So each time I compute new weights, that's a step of the algorithm. And what I say when I mean I use a new sample at every step of the algorithm, it's about this guy here. It's about this guy where, you know, where do I evaluate my gradients? And so at each step of the algorithm, I'm gonna draw a new Gaussian vector. I'm gonna ask the teacher, what's the label on that vector? And then I'm gonna use that to evaluate the gradient. And then at the next step of SG, I'm going to take a new Gaussian sample, I'm going to take a new label, and so on. Okay. In, in this case, if we consider an, an image, the, the sample will be a single image, right? Yes. Is it... The sample would be the image and its label. Okay. And go back to the um, where you, you, you present the teacher student step. Here, the teacher is the, uh, is an, uh, is a layer or or what? Because it didn't really get the, the the difference between the neural for teacher student and for for the student and the teacher. What is the difference between both? What's the difference between the student and the teacher? Yeah, in the system when you have the neural the network, what is the difference between them? Okay, so the difference between them is that. One is the student. So the student is the network that I'm, tra I'm training, okay? The student is the one where I'm optimizing the weights. The teacher is the one that generates my data, okay? So this guy generates my, my data. So when before I was using a new image and I looked at the image and I said, okay, this is a dog or this is a cat. What I'm doing now is I'm taking a new noise vector and I'm asking this teacher network um, to tell me what's the label for this image. Okay, but this teacher network is, is frozen, it's fixed. Does that make sense? Yeah, I get it a little bit. As like, uh, we have image, we, we, 
we, we, you rotate the image to get a new label and give to the student, something like that. Think about it this way. So in, in a normal machine learning task, you have images and labels, okay? And here you have Gaussian vectors with noise, which have a label, which is the output of the teacher. Okay, and what you have in both cases is the student, which is, you know, the two layer network that you're training to learn either this task or either this task. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I also have a question. Yes, please go. Um, so the structure of the teacher's network is the same as the structure of the student network in terms of number of neurons, uh, layers, and function G, or it can be different? Very good question. So you have some freedom here. Um, what we're gonna focus on is teachers which have two layers of weights, simply because we don't have the mathematical tools to really go, go deep yet. Um, but you have some freedom, for example, in the number of neurons. So you can have more or less number of neurons. So I'm talking about these guys here. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't do that. I'm talking about these guys here. You can have more or less numbers uh, of, of neurons in the teacher. So you can have a case where the student is more powerful than its teacher. And you can also have a model or a case where the teacher is more powerful than the student. Actually, you can play interesting games now because in reality, you know, um, the student will not be able to achieve a perfect score on, on real training data. So you might want to make the teacher a bit more harder, uh, a bit bigger than the student. You can look at the interplay of different activation functions. You, you, you can really get, get creative here. Depends a little bit on what you want to model. Thank you. Good. All right, now we have this new new toy. We have this teacher. Now let's see what we can what we can do with it. How that helps us with the analysis. I said that the key um, quantity that I want to to analyze is this generalization error. Right. So let me remind you. This is just the expectation of student of. Uh, minus the two label squared over the data. Now that I have the teacher, I can I can write this a bit more explicitly, and maybe we have a chance to actually do this average. Let's uh, let's do that. So by putting in the teacher, what I mean is I can now replace the y star, right? I can now say, well, this is just a student minus the teacher output, and the average is now taken over over x over the side dimensional vector, right? So this is a bit tough because there's a very high dimensional average and high dimensional averages are a bit of a pain. Um, with statistical physicists, we'd like to have something that's a bit lower dimensional in terms of how we describe the system. If we write this out a bit more in detail, what this expression actually looks like, we'll have something that looks like this, right? So this, I'm just writing down the definition basically of the student output where again, Lambda k is wk times x. n is the input dimension minus m. So this is the sum over the teacher. v star k g nu, sorry, this should be m, nu m. Where nu m is now the same quantity, but for the teacher. And we're going to call lambda k and nu m uh, the local fields or the pre-activations of uh, the teacher and the student, because they're essentially what, what goes into the nonlinearity. Okay. And I really invite you to remember these guys well, because they're going to be really key to a lot of what we will be talking about um, today and next week. Why are they key? They're key because you see that now in this expression for the generalization error, which is really what we're, what we're after, what we want to calculate as a function of time, the inputs x, they don't appear directly. They don't appear explicitly. They only appear through these dot products uh, with the teacher and the student weights, wkx, wm star times x. These are high dimensional products, right? So these are really, uh, I can write this out maybe just for this, this one, uh, just for the student, okay. So these are really sums up to n of w, k, i, x, i, and x, each x, i is a Gaussian variable. So by the central limit theorem, you have that both the lambda k's and the new m are jointly Gaussian. Okay, and this is true um, for any given student or any given teacher, right? Simply because the inputs X are Gaussian. The sum of a Gaussians, you multiply it with something, doesn't matter, 
the sum will be will be Gaussian. I should emphasize here that I want to calculate this generalization error for a given student and a given teacher. Okay, so from now on, the question will always be, you know, you give me a student, you give me a teacher, what's its test error? Or, you know, you give me a teacher and you give me the student after a hundred steps of, of training, what's the generalization error? So what I can do here is I can, you know, replace this high dimensional average over X with a low dimensional average over these lambdas and nus. There's K different random variables lambda. And like we said earlier, K is say two or four, but it's order one. And there is M different nus. Okay, and K is four and M is two. No. So we can rewrite this average as an average over these low dimensional fields. Uh, And I'm making a conscious effort here to, to sort of keep my handwriting legible, but if I, if I fail at that, then please, please let me know. I don't know how many of you here are a statistical physicists or how many of you have maybe done replica calculations or this kind of stuff. But uh, these local fields, they're very similar to, um, and this is just gonna be a quick aside, they're very similar to the auxiliary fields that you introduce if you do a standard replica computation, okay? If you, if you do, I don't know, in any replica computation, you would introduce auxiliary fields, you introduce delta functions. And, and what you want to do is you want to replace some high dimensional average of an average over these low dimensional um, local fields. And you will exploit the take out and you look at the saddle point and, and so on. And here the idea is, is, is really the same, that um, what are the auxiliary fields in the replica calculations? They are the um, local fields or the pre-activations in this neural network. And indeed, I'm talking about dynamics. But you can also look at sort of the statics of the problem. And for that, you need replicas. And then you will find that your auxiliary fields in your replicas are exactly these, these lambdas. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you've done replicas, maybe this is a helpful. helpful Last thing. Yes. Uh, related to what you just said. So, at the beginning, a replica said... expert. So, now I regret that I made the, this uh, connection. No, no, not about replica. I was just wanting to ask you why you said that K uh, had to be order one. But in principle, can you take k going to infinity after you took m going to infinity? After, um, like, what what do you normally do in committee machine? Like k goes to infinity, but once you already took yes, um, yeah, you should. I think there's. I think you should be able to do that. I have never really looked at what happens in this limit. And actually, I think an, an interesting question would be to compare what happens if you go to this limit compared to what happens in this mean field limit where you just let the number of neurons go to infinity. What, what you call the mean field limits is the tangent kernel limit? So what I call the, so the neural tangent kernel is in the mean field limit. So it's, it's a bit, um, so mean field limit for me just means that your N is finite and your K goes to infinity. So your number of neuron goes to infinity, your input dimension stays finite. Yeah. Now, depending on your scaling in this limit, you can get into the NTK regime, but you can also stay in the feature learning regime. That really depends on a little bit your learning rate, your initialization. Okay, thank you. Can you precise what the, is the NTK regime? Yes, so, okay, another little aside. We remember this, this computation. Um, Basically, okay, let's, let's say we have um, finite inputs and now my student would look like this. Oh. Um, let's actually just, just do it like this. This is just a two-layer network. Now we send K to infinity. This network, when you train with SCD, it will still be able to learn, um, to learn. and the weights of this layer will, will move a lot, okay? Now, if you go to a certain scaling, and it's a bit subtle how you could do that, you could, for example, instead of looking at the one over k, you could look at one over square root of k. Uh, you could choose a certain scaling of the learning rate of the initialization. Um, you will get to another regime where you still have an infinite number of neurons, okay? But these weights, these first layer weights will now move very little, vanishingly little. And this is this NTK regime. And I'm gonna come back to this at the end of, of today's talk. Uh, this is very nice from a theoretical point of view, 
because it's it's easy to analyze and you can say a lot of things. It's a bit, as a model, it's not as expressive because your first layer weights don't really move. You're essentially learning, it's, it's a bit like random features. So you fall back into some sort of kernel learning regime. So it's there are of, things. Uh... It's a perturbation limit. Yeah, I mean, it's a perturbation theory of the purely random uh, feature model. Exactly, exactly. Okay. You can think of it as a linear perturbation of the random feature model. And so you can show quite easily and quite elegantly uh, things that you can learn with a two-layer neural network, but that you cannot learn with um, with the in the in this lazy regime. And that's why it's called lazy. Thank you. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a really hot topic in, in the theory of neural networks. So these are these are really good questions. And I'll, I'll try to like periodically come back to these points. Up. So what we were, we were looking here at the calculation of the generalization error. Right, so we wanted to know now that we have a student, what's the generalization error? And we noticed that this high dimensional average over the data, we can actually replace that with a low dimensional average over these um, local fields. Now, why is that useful? In general, you know, there's still a nonlinear function here, so this would be a function of all the moments of the distribution of lambda and nu. But we know that. Um, Lambda and nu are jointly Gaussian, right? Because we have Gaussian inputs. So this leads to a huge simplification in the sense that I can now just look at the first two moments of lambda and nu. Okay. We're gonna say that lambda k and nu m have mean zero because we just took our inputs with mean zero. And we're gonna call their second moments. Q for the student student, we're gonna call them R for the teacher student, and we're gonna call them T for the teacher teacher, okay? So these are our order parameters if you want to talk about this in the in statistical physics jargon. These are low dimensional objects, obviously, because you know Q for example is a K times K matrix, and since our distribution of lambda and Q is Gaussian, these second moments capture the full distribution. So in other words, we can say that our high dimensional object, which was this generalization arrow, which was a function of all the student parameters, all the teacher parameters, it becomes a very low dimensional object. It becomes something that I can write as a function of just the order parameters. And Okay, the, the second layer weights, but there's also just, just K of them, okay? So from a statistical physics perspective, we've done the first and then maybe even most important task of the problem. We found the right order parameters for the problem, right? So they are these, these Q, R, and T um, parameters. So if I tell you these overlaps, you will know the generalization error. And so any question that I have about the student, like I said earlier, you know, you give me a student, um, what's its test error? You give me a student after, and I ask you, you know, after 100 steps of training, what's its test error? You can now translate them from, you know, here's my student into questions about, given these order parameters, what's my order? What's my generalization error? So that's, the, if you will, from, from a statistical point of view, that's the statistics of the, pro the statics of the problem. So equation, a question about the dynamics of, theta of the student now becomes a question about the dynamics of Q and of R, okay? So if we understand the dynamics of Q and R, we know everything about the, the system, about the, about the learning. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So you said that you, so the X, the, the inputs are uh, Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Uh, but so in this case, the fact that the, this cavity, this, um, this auxiliary fields are cavity, uh, uh, cavity fields are uh, jointly Gaussian is, is, is true for any size, right? You don't need the central limit theorem in this case. And so my question is, if you want to drop uh, the assumption that the X are Gaussian and even take like weakly correlated X's, I think if they're weakly enough correlated central limit would still apply and therefore your arguments would apply in the thermodynamic limit, right? Or Yes, no, you're absolutely right. 
and that's what we're going to call, talk about next Tuesday. So for weekly correlate, so what John said, or John's point is that, you know, a sum of Gaussian random variables is always Gaussian for any n, so I don't need the thermodynamic limit here. If they're weakly correlated, so if instead of, you know, right now I have, um, right now I have this, right? So if instead of being, you know, not correlated at all, they would be weakly correlated. So if instead this was like order one over n or something, um, these fields would still be jointly Gaussian. And indeed, what we're going to talk next week is what happens if this is the case. And we're going to prove that in some cases, which are quite interesting in terms of modeling real data, this is still the case. So this covariance matrix will have only a few, will be, you know, on average, these entries will be small. And so this analysis still goes through. But yeah, you, you're like a la bonne piste, as you would say in French. Okay. Um, let's make a quick check for the time, Jean. So, um, a couple of, when did we start? We started at five past three? You're still muted, sorry. Let's say you can aim for 20 or, yeah, 20, 20 minutes, then some questions if it's okay for you. But okay. I mean, I'm yeah, happy yeah. to listen more, but. Uh... No, 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 <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's not. Uh, I know how hard it is on Zoom to, to follow. So, so, and I really appreciate all the questions so far. So that's, that's really cool. Uh, and that's really makes a lot of fun. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna exaggerate. I promise. But okay, let's say I, I aim for 4 p.m. and uh, and then I'll stop. So okay, we have uh, we have this reduction. We have found the order parameters of the problem, and we have found that you know if I think back to my learning dynamics all the way up here, now I don't really need to understand what's happening to every single parameter. I just need to understand what's happening to these order parameters Q and R. Then I know everything about my student during the training. So how do you get, um, how do you, how, what describes the dynamic of Q and R? And here we get some help from some classical uh, Statfors work, uh, Statfors classics by Sarden Solar and Biel and Riegler. Who of course built on a whole, uh, on a whole uh, series of, of, of literature. And what they showed is that indeed, what you can find is you can derive a set of ODEs that govern the dynamics of your order parameters. In other words, you can write down a first order, a set of first order ODEs, you know, like this. Let's call this R of Q. And these ODEs will describe exactly what's going on in the thermodynamic limit. So here we now really need the N to infinity limit. And they derive these in, in a series of, of you know, uh, PILs and uh, JFSAs. So they, they sort of gave a heuristic um, derivation. I'm just gonna give you a, a, a taste of this, of this derivation. It's, it's really quite simple and quite elegant. And the idea is the following. So, um, let's stay at the, st at the finite step level, okay? Let's not go to the thermodynamic limit just yet. Let's stay at the finite step limit. Um, and let's think about how to get an equation for, for the teacher student over, for example. So what we really want then is we want to understand what happens at the step, u plus one and minus. Okay. okay, and so this is nothing but Wk at plus one. Here I'm just putting in the um, the definition of the order parameter. Ah, uh, maybe one thing I should mention. I'm sorry. So I'll just write this out. So you might be wondering where did I get this um, definition from? So these order parameters, as I introduced them here. They may seem like a little bit of a of an ad hoc thing, you know. Okay, it's, it's this correlation variables between these um, between these okay local fields, but but what do they mean? Like, why why are they important? Like, do they have a, a physical interpretation? And in fact, they do. And it's it's quite simple to see in this case. And we can again illustrate this using the teacher student uh, the teacher student overlap. So if I write this out, so this is the expectation of lambda k nu m. Um, what this really is, is a sum, I'm just subbing, subbing in the definitions here of 
lambda and k, it's w i k, w j star m, sorry, x j. Now this is just a delta function, right? Because our inputs are uncorrelated. So in the end, what you find here, this is just one over n times the dot product between the k student vector and the m teacher vector. So this teacher student overlap, this R order parameter, it's really an overlap. It's really an overlap between, you can think about each neuron as having a weight vector, okay? And what this teacher or student overlap measures is the angle between these two vectors. So one of the student nodes and one of the teacher nodes, these are vectors in n dimensions. And intuitively, you would think that if you take a random teacher, uh, you initialize your student randomly, then these two vectors will be orthogonal to each other. Okay, and you would hope that during learning, somehow the student finds back the parameters of the teacher and that this angle between the two goes from the 90 degrees at initialization to something that's smaller. And indeed, that's what you find in, if you, if you actually run an experiment, if you run a simulation or if you calculate what's happening to these, um, to these guys, right? So that's really, that's the physical interpretation of this teacher-student overlap. And then, you know, you can sort of convince yourself that the student overlap student student overlap Q, it's really the same idea, but for the student weights. And then the teacher, teacher overlap is the same idea, but for the teacher weights. Okay, so that's the physical interpretation of these order parameters. So I'm using this expression now. When I say this expression, I mean this expression. And I'm looking, how does it change over time? Now the teacher weights don't change over time, but the student weights do. So I'm just writing that out here. And now I'm going to substitute in the SGD equation, okay, the weight update equation for these second layer weights. And so what I'm going to find is something that looks a little bit like this. Um, or let me write this slightly differently. So I have the learning rate, I have the one over n from my definition, I have a second layer weight hanging around here that comes from my SGD update. I have the derivative of the student activation. Delta is basically, you know, student minus teacher output. Okay, this is a scalar. And I have the input x, and now I dot it with the teacher weight m over square root of m. And so we see that this guy, we actually met this guy before, this is just new m, okay? And so if I write this out, I see that the average, because I want to know the average change of the R weight is really just an average over stuff that I kind of already know. Uh, in this case, yeah. So the average that I still need to, to evaluate here in front, it's again, only an average over local fields. There's the lambda, but here's another lambda, here's a new, here's another new. And like we said before, these are jointly Gaussian um, random variables. So this expression, whatever it is, it will again only depend on the order parameters. So again, you know, I will have to um, evaluate integrals that look like that look like this, you know, g prime lambda k, g lambda l, nu m. And so this is going to be, again, a function of only the order parameters. And so these finite difference update equations, they close. And um, what's nice is, and you sort of heuristically as a physicist, uh, you would almost expect this is that if you now go to the thermodynamic limit, right? This one over n factor that's in front of my update here, you can interpret that as an as an infinitesimal time step, okay? Or more precisely, you can introduce a continuous time, which is just the number of samples over the input dimension. And if you're a physicist, you can just believe that. Uh, you yeah, know, these finite differences then converge onto ODEs in the continuous time limit as you send n to infinity. 
Okay, and so this was the serious, the idea of the heuristic derivation of of, of sudden solar, and then um, two years ago, actually, with um, with some some colleagues, uh, Andrew Saxman, Duet Vani, Florent Jacquelin, and Peter Castelbo, we managed to prove that these equations are actually rigorously correct. So that you can really take this this limit one over n, um, uh, n goes to infinity, and that you really find back these ODEs mathematically robust. Okay, but the the idea. The heuristic derivation that was all there in sudden solar already. So I was just to give you an idea of the of the derivation. Let's let's zoom out a little bit in the remaining five minutes, and let's step back and think about what we've done. So we started with this idea of trying to track two layer networks, right? Um, and we said, well, actually analyzing this on real data, it's a bit tough. Let's go to this uh, teacher student limit. Let's go to this synthetic data setup where I have noise and I get the labels from a random teacher. Let's try to see what happens in this case. And we saw that in this case, the key quantity, the, the generalization error, it's actually just a function of, um, you know, a few order parameters, Q, R, T. This is an idea that, you know, this is, this, is, this is quite appealing. And so any question about how the student evolves becomes a question about how these order parameters evolve. And the evolution of these order parameters was then given by sudden solar, and it takes the form of this closed set of differential equations. And if you're worried about mathematical rigor, and that at some point you should a little bit, you can even prove that they're correct. Now let me finish with um, a few plots. So this will require some... I have just a quick changes. question. Yes, please, this is a good My last, idea. because after I have to go, sorry. My question yeah. is, is the this uh, theory robust to, uh, I guess, yes, to the fact that you would take at every step, let's say a mini batch, but which is never seen again with fresh data points that are never used again, but instead of taking one, you take 10. I don't know. Or... That's fine. That's not a problem. Okay. So the key is really, I, that's, that's right. So the key here is that you need these, um, you know, you need these local fields that appear in your update equations, the lambda case that appear in the updates of your order parameters. You need them to still be jointly Gaussian and their covariance to be expressible by just these simple order parameters. Okay. As soon as you reuse samples, you know, the W of, of the X that you've already seen, it will be correlated in a very complicated way with the weights. And then the description breaks down. So going to mini batches of, of finite size, no problem, but reusing samples, that's where it gets, it gets hairy. Okay. Basically, if you, if you reuse samples, then you have to look at two-time correlation functions. Q, you can think of that as a one-time correlation. If you reuse samples, you have to look at two-time correlations. It looks a bit like William de Groschan and stuff. Okay, let's, let's just look at some some pictures to to uh, to wrap this up. So I thought you know I'd, I'd at least show you that that what I just told you is I, I didn't just make that up, and that it actually works. So this is a plot um, where I'm training three different neural networks of three different sizes. Okay, it's the number of neurons, and what I'm plotting here is the test error of these students as a function of time, training time. Okay, which I call the alpha for some reason that. It's not quite clear to me anymore. And what I'm plotting here is two things. The lines are the results um, or the predictions for the test error that I get from integrating the ODEs. And the crosses are simulations. And you can see that indeed, you know, like the, the finite system that I train in the neural network and the, um, and the simulations agree quite well with each other. And you can see that the, so the ODEs capture what's going on with SGD. And to sort of motivate you that this approach is actually quite interesting, I'd like to just point out one last thing um, that already the simple plot and the simple model reveals about the, the learning process. And um, I'd like to convince you that this is actually something, well, I'll, I'll show you later, that this is actually something that happens in, in deeper networks too, that are not just trained on noise. And so what I'd like to draw your attention to is this plateau here in the middle. Um, oops, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I can't see it. Okay, so you see that between sort of step 10 to step 200, the error of the green and the red or orange uh, student, it goes on some sort of plateau, right? So there's initial decay, this is log scale. There's initial plateau, 
and then the error goes down to, to a really low value. Now, what's happening at this intermediate stage? What's happening at this plateau? Well, what's happening there is that the student is um, learning a good linear model, okay? So the student has some correlation with the teacher, uh, but it's not enough to really learn the task well. And what I'm plotting here is in this four times four plot is the teacher student overlap, okay? So this is telling you the, the, ang the overlap between any student vector and any teacher vector. And you can see that all of them are non-zero, so there are co some correlations. But they're also, you know, all to all correlated. So every node of the student is correlated to every node of the teacher. If I look at this same overlap plot, at this teacher over student overlap, at the end of training, the picture is quite different. Now you see that there's four yellow squares. What does that mean? That means that each student node is correlated with only one of the teacher nodes. Okay, and it's correlated to it one to one. Like it really just basically copied the parameter from the teacher node. And it's not correlated with all the other teacher nodes. This is what's called specialization. And you can see that it has a real effect here on the, on the performance of the student because it makes a difference between a model that has an error of like 10 to the minus one and an error, a model that has an error of 10 to the minus four. Okay. Now, um, this specialization is, is something that's, that's studied a lot. And uh, you can study it in detail with these, with these ODEs. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail about that. What I'm just going to say is that, or what I'm just going to demonstrate to you is that the specialization, so you go from a good linear model, which is what you have on the plateau, to a very good specialized model, is something you see in other regimes too. For example, you see it in this infamous mean field regime that we talked about. So this is the regime where you keep the input dimension finite, and you let the number of neurons go to infinity. You see here, this is uh, from a really nice paper by the group of Andrea Montanari, led by Song Mei in Plas uh, two years ago, where they looked at basically the same question that we're asking now, online learning, they plot the test error, they call it the risk as a function of training time, they call it the iteration. And they, you know, again, simulations, uh, crosses, their theory is aligned, they have a PDE to describe the dynamics in this case. And you can also see that there's this sort of plateau. So this seems to be in these two lane networks quite a recurring feature. What's maybe surprising is that it also happens in deep networks. So this is a very nice paper that came out at NeurIPS last year. NeurIPS is sort of the biggest um, machine learning conference. And what these guys showed, Pritam and, and the group at Harvard, uh, they basically looked at specialization in deep neural networks. So they trained deep networks on a real, um, on a real image data set. So this was uh, Cypher 10. And blue is a linear classifier. And at the plateau in the ODE limit, what you basically have is the performance of just a linear classifier. In other words, a classifier with just one neuron, okay? And then you specialize to something that's better. What they show here is that actually the blue line, the linear classifier, it's really correlated and it's really going together with the deep neural network that they train on this image classification task. So in other words, in the beginning of training, you only learn this linear model with these deep neural networks on, on this image classification data set. And only after a certain time, you, you specialize or you learn a more complicated function, okay? So I really like this example because it, it, it sort of shows two things. One, um, that it, you know, it's useful to look at these simple models because some of the things that you see in them really carries over to much more complicated settings. And because I really want to make this point that learning in your networks sort of occurs in steps and you learn functions of increasing complexity as the people from this paper put it, right? So you first learn just a linear model, which is as if you would train just one neuron. And only after a certain time, only after the student has seen a certain amount of data, you really start to pick up on the more complicated structure and, and you specialize to more complicated functions that you cannot express with one neuron anymore. Now to understand that a bit better, we should also have a slightly better model for, for data structure. And, um, and that's what we're gonna do next week. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much for, for your attention. And yeah, let's let's have some more questions if you want. Sebastian, how does hey. all of this depend on the, the loss function? Uh, that's a really good question. So the loss function is, is um, always an issue. So the analysis that I just showed you, the ODE analysis, for that, unfortunately, it's crucial that it's the mean squared error. Or at least, you know, if you want to 
you can always write down ODEs, but if you want to really analyze them, look at the fixed points, the perturbation theorem, or them, what have you, you really want the error to be uh, the mean squared error. Now for these, and this is the same for also the, song, the Montanari analysis and the mean field limit. Now for these experiments, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure anymore, but I think they also see this when they train on cross entropy, for example, because here they trained on classification. Um, and so I'm pretty sure that they trained on cross entropy too. Let me actually check this. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, they train on, so the Harvard guys train on, on cross entropy too. Okay. So the specialization seems to be a bit robust with respect to, um, with respect to loss function. But the specialization transition we're talking about was with IID data. So in, in, in what I showed you, it last was with paper. IID data. Uh, last paper. Last no, paper. this is really, this, this is the actual Cypher 10. Sorry, stop sharing my screen. Oh, I see. No, no, this is the actual Cypher 10. So this is really the, that's what you uh, so here they did, for example, okay, they did MNIST, uh, but they also did Cypher 10, animals versus objects, um, first Wait. five versus last five. So, and this is, a, I think this is a convolutional network. They really did some increasingly complex uh, experiments here. I see. So oh, this okay. reminds me a little bit of uh, what Sachs and Ganguly were, were showing the linear network, that the linear network picks up uh, single values one after the other. Mm -hmm. So that's really rated. So what you're alluding to just for, for everybody, so what I was alluding to here is there's a really nice series of papers by, by Andrew Sachs um, from the group of, or from then of the group of Surya Ganguly, where they looked at the dynamics of, of linear networks. Um, so linear networks have no non-linearities in the middle. And they find something, specialization in the sense that the linear network sweeps up one singular value in the covariance of the inputs after the other. And um, it's related, it's not quite the same because the linear network, of course, it can never learn something that's better than a linear classifier, right? So in this sense, uh, so that specialization is a bit different. It's really the sweeping up of non-trivial covariance uh, eigenvalues. So can you say something on the time scale over which this, uh, over, uh, at which you have this crossover between the linear and non-linear regime? What does it depend on? That's a really good, that's a really good question. And that's something actually that we try to look at a little bit. And it's really subtle because it depends on really fine details of, for example, the initialization. So basically what you can think about this plateau and the breakaway from the plateau, the specialization as some sort of symmetry breaking transition. The network has to break the symmetry between its own neurons and the neurons of the teacher. So it needs a fluctuation to basically kick it from the saddle point. And this fluctuation can come from the initialization. And so some small changes in the initialization will change the, the plateau. But so saying something precise here is, is tough. This is also why small batches work better than uh, large batches, right? Yes, so here you really want some stochasticity, exactly. So here's small batch, this is really an argument for small batches because you really want some stochasticity to kick you away from the saddle point. Yeah. Okay, so... If there are no other questions, then uh, I guess, uh, Sebastian, uh, the, uh, the next uh, lectures uh, will... Uh... Will be next week, uh, same time. So next Tuesday, oops. Okay. next Tuesday, uh, I don't know if I can end here, but next Tuesday at 3 p.m. if I remember correctly. Okay. Okay, so if there are no further questions, then uh, we thank uh, Sebastian again for the very nice lecture. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for all the questions. That was really cool. Yes. And, and yeah, see you next week. Too soon. <laughs> yeah, bye-bye. Okay, bye. bye. bye.